We're going to take up where we left off last week. We, last week we began to talk about Mark's edition of the Great Commission. If you want to turn your, if you got your Bible, turn it open to Mark 16. You can go ahead and do that. And, uh, but I brought, I brought along something I thought was funny tonight, if you don't mind if I share something funny. You ever notice sometimes people in certain situations, they just don't know what to say? You know what I mean? For instance, at a funeral, how many of you have noticed no, nobody knows what to say at a funeral? Even the preachers don't know what to say. I've, I've heard some of the most ridiculous things come out of preachers' mouths at funerals. You know, it's, it's a hard time. It's an awkward time, and people don't know what to say. They don't know what to say, you know, if somebody face plants right out in front of the church, in front of 150 people, you know. They don't know whether to run off, laugh, snicker, cry, go get a hanky. They don't know what to do. You know, there's several situations where people don't know what to do. Well, uh, Don get brought this to me. Was it today? And some of these are pretty funny. They, this is a list of 25 really weird things that people say to pastors and other church leaders. And I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm thankful they put this together because I've had people t uh, say some really weird things to me, but I can't repeat them because it's some of y'all that said it, so I can't talk about that. <laughs> You know, it's a little too personal, but, but, uh, but, but, you know, we've got a list of something, something somebody else said to some other pastor somewhere else. So, so some of these are kind of funny. Uh, uh, sometimes people can say some very harsh and hurtful things to a pastor and, uh, you know, you just have to, you just have to, you know, get spiritual and, and take it, you know, and realize people don't, they, they don't always think about what they're saying. And then sometimes it's the most hilarious things in the world. So anyway, here's, I'm not going to read all 25 of them. I'm going to try to pick the ones I thought, think were funny. But uh, weird things people say to pastors. Here's one. Pastor, we need a small group for cat lovers. You know, you've got all kinds of groups, special interest groups. You've got gun groups, biking groups, hiking groups, Bible study groups, women's birthday club groups like we have here, right? Well, this person wanted a cat lover group. And uh, someone said maybe they'd serve meow mix for the snack. I'm... Someone complained, our expensive coffee is attracting too many hipsters. That'd be terrible if we had too many hipsters around here coming to church, wouldn't it? Here's one. Pastor, preachers who do not wear suits and ties are not saved. It's in the Bible. <clears throat> Pastor, your socks are distracting. Maybe I'll just stop wearing any. Pastor, you should not make people leave the youth group after they graduate. We have that problem around here. Pastor Joey is so popular, adults try to cram into the youth service over there. But you know, when you get about 70, it gets weird for you to be in the youth group. Pastor, we need to start attracting some normal people at church. <laughs> I like that one. Ugh. Pastor, I have developed cancer because you don't preach from the King James Version. That, these are all true. These were really said by people. No, nobody made these up. Pastor, your wife never compliments me about my hair or my dress. David, you'll like this one. Pastor, not enough people signed up for the golf tournament. You have poor leadership skills. <laughs> some, I, there's some responses. Some of them, this, this one pastor said, he responded to that one by said, you know, I expected more since most of the deacons play golf every Sunday morning. <laughs> Somebody else said, if Jesus sang from the red hymnals, why can't we? That's wrong. He, Jesus sang from the blue ones. It wasn't the red ones at all. Was mm, let's see. Oh, now, this is a legitimate gripe. Pastor, you did not wrap the hot dogs in bacon for the church picnic. Everybody knows there should have been some bacon on those hot dogs, right? Uh, <clears throat> I love this one. Pastor, the toilet paper is on the wrong way in the ladies' restroom. It's rolled under. Why don't you ever preach on Tim Tebow? Oh, yeah, we'll do a six-part series on him this fall. I don't understand this one. You don't have ashtrays in the fellowship hall. 
Did Pastor, did you see me waving in the back of the auditorium? You preached too long. It was time to eat. <laughs> One more. Pastor, we're leaving the church because you have a red cross on the building, and that's the color of the devil. <laughs> you know, people really say things like that. So anyway, be careful what you say because next time I might be repeating you. I might make a list of what you said. Uh, but but let's, let's be careful what we say. You know, you know I, I'm, I'm, I often harp on the Facebook thing. You know, be careful what you say on Facebook. Uh, but be careful what you say to one another. Be careful what you say to your spouse, you know. And, uh, you know, if you say something off the wall to me, I'll just love you and forgive you and we'll go on. But, but, but words, words can make a difference. Sometimes they're funny, but sometimes they can be hurtful. And uh, because words are power containers. Everything you see was created by words. God spoke everything into existence. Words are power containers. That's why the, the, the proverb says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can strip somebody down to nothing emotionally with your tongue lashing. And you can build people up and encourage them and minister minister good to them and in, in, encouragement to them and inspiration to them. And, and, and uh, Paul even said this way one time, he says, when you speak to one another, make sure that your speech is seasoned with salt. In other words, make, make them better. How many of you know salt makes anything taste better? So, so make, make a person better with, your, with, with the words of your lips and, uh, and that, that's, a, that's a good thing to aspire to. All right, let's look at Mark 16. Another subject. We're going to talk about Mark's edition of the Great Commission. Or, remember my, I subtitled, We Need to Get Out More. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to get out more. And, of course, we're talking about the Great Commission. And this is where Jesus sends the church out into all the world to preach the good news. The most wonderful news that the world has ever heard, that God loved us so much that he sent his son and he came down here to get us. He came down here to rescue us. He came down here to forgive us. He came down here to save us. He came down here to pay our price. He came down here to heal us and lift us and encourage us and teach us and disciple us and change us and transform us and make us ready for eternity to adopt us, huh? to accept us, and to make us into who and what he wants us to be. That's that's part of the good news, just in a nutshell. And so last week we read Matthew's edition and Luke's edition. Then we focused on Mark. We're just going to go to Mark this evening. Look at Mark chapter 16. We're going to drop down to verse 9 and start right there. We talked quite a bit on this chapter last week. Let's start in verse 9. It says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom He had cast, previously he had cast seven demonic spirits, seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him, his disciples, as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, Jesus appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, or the rest of the disciples, neither believed they them. Now notice these disciples, some of these, these women have seen Jesus, a couple of the disciples have seen Jesus, but the ones that haven't seen Him yet, they're not having it. They're not believing the, the, the report. They didn't believe it. Even though, if you remember, reading carefully through the Gospels, Jesus predicted His own death and resurrection on a, a number of occasions. But it's like they weren't listening. They just didn't register. They just didn't get it. How many of you know? And they'd been with Jesus three and a half years. How many of you know you can go to church three and a half years and still not get, get a lot of it? You, you know, we, we have to open our hearts, open our minds, stick with it, think it through. You know, we, we think, how, how come these, these disciples, how come they had doubt and unbelief about His resurrection? Well, how come you and I have doubt and unbelief in a lot of the promises of God a lot of times? Or we won't, we're, we're slow to believe what people have told us. And so, that they're, they're, they're mourning and they're weeping. And it's like they're going through a funeral. They're in grief because Jesus, the one they'd put all their hope and faith in, has been crucified. And they're hearing these reports of him being raised from the dead, but ah, they just can't hardly believe that. 
Then verse 14, Jesus is going to appear to them and convince them. It said, Afterward He appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, as they sat at eating, eating dinner. And He upbraided or scolded them with their unbelief. He scolded them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they believed not them which had seen Him after He was risen. And He said unto them, Go ye. I remember uh, Wayne Myers, missionary to Mexico for 50 plus years, maybe 60 plus years. He's in his 90s now. Uh, last I heard he was still kicking, still alive, still living in Mexico City, still preaching the gospel down there, way up in his 90s. I never will forget, I heard him in Dallas preaching one time back in the 70s. And he was, talk, he was preaching on missions. And he went to the Great Commission. And, he's, and he was talking about go, go, go. He said, man, we need to go. We need to go reach the world. We need to go out there and love the world. We need to go out there and preach to the world. He says, I'm telling you, he said, God wants us to go. He said, even God's name is two-thirds go. And uh, I thought that was pretty clever. Anyway, so he was a funny guy. He's always joking. But, but uh, Jesus says, go, go ye and all. Notice he didn't say go to a church house and sit. See, that's what these guys have been doing. They're sitting and eating and mourning and weeping. And I've seen a lot of churches like that. It's just all caught up. Just It's all sad. It's all negative. They just go to the... They go to the church house and they'll cry and they'll mourn and they'll gripe and they'll complain and they're, they're negative and they talk about what's not happening and what God's not doing and what people aren't doing and people aren't doing right. God's not listening and God's not answering their prayers and nobody wants to live right anymore and our kids don't want to come to church and, you know, it goes on and on and on. And really that's an indicator of doubt and unbelief. That, that's a companion with doubt and unbelief. We need to be up, smiling filled with expectation, ready for God's assignment in our life. Let's go out there and get something done. Let's go out there and do something lest we do nothing. Amen? Yeah, let's, let's go. Let's be two-thirds go just like God is. Amen? So, so he's, he's, he says, I want you to go. I don't want you to sit here and mourn and weep. I'm alive. There's nothing to cry about. Everybody say, there's nothing to cry about. Now, I'm, I'm not minimizing the pain and the sufferings that we go through in life. I understand we go through pains and sufferings. But as far as Jesus is concerned, if you're worried about Jesus, he, said, he says, I'm not dead. He said, there's nothing to cry about here. And folks, I want to tell you something. There's nothing to cry about in the gospel. There's nothing to cry about in the message of God. It's all up from here. I'm telling you, he, he, he came to lift people. And so he says, I want you to go into all the world, all the world, and preach or proclaim or announce the gospel. The word gospel means good news to every creature. Can I tell you something? If it's good news, we ought to preach it glad. You can't preach good news mad. You can't preach good news sad. We got too many mad and sad preachers. We got too many mad and sad believers and Christians, right? We need to be glad, glad believers, preaching it glad. He says, I want you to go into all the world and preach the good news to every creation. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned or condemned. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. That's where he went. He went to sit on the right hand of God. Where did they go? Well, they went forth. They went out. And they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following Amen. Now, I love Mark's Great Commission. It's, it's, it's the most shocking, stunning, heart-stopping, and Pentecostal edition of the Great Commission that there is in the New Testament. You know, Matthew 28 is just kind of settled down and nice, you know. You know, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to what I've taught you. That's nice. It's even keel. Nobody gets offended. Luke 24 is a little, little more sharp, you know. Uh, repentance and forgiveness of sin should be preached in all the nations. Okay, he talked about repentance. I, you know, puts a little people on edge a little bit. Oh, we got something to repent. Oh, we've been doing something wrong. Oh, I get it. You're going to tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, Jesus tells people they're wrong. We're wrong. How many of you know we're wrong? He's right. And then we go to Mark 16, and man, he just blows it out of the water here. Man, he's talking about speaking in tongues, <laughs> healing, casting out demons, getting up, 
from the church dinner and going outside the four walls of the church and getting something done. I love it because this one's full of, in fact, I, Mark's my favorite gospel because it's, it's the action gospel. Man, it's, it's the shortest gospel, but it's filled with action stories. And it ends with action, with Jesus scolding his followers for their inaction, prompting them to go out and to go into action. And then it wraps up with them obeying him and going into action, reaching out to the world, preaching the gospel everywhere, and the Lord working with them, confirming the word of signs following. Uh, interesting statement there. The Lord was working with them. Literally, He was working with them, partnering in labor with them. And the Greek says this, He was putting forth power together with them. Let me tell you something, when we reach out, when we, when we become outbound, when we get out of the house, how many of you know some of us need to get out more? Now, why did, well, when we get out, He begins to put forth power together with us. Let me say that again. When we go out, when we reach out, when we reach out of our own life, when we get out of our bubble, when we get out of our sanctuary, when we get out of our comfort zone, when we become outward in focus, Christians, that's when God begins to put, pour, put forth power together with us. How many of you want God to put forth power together with you? Then you got to get out of your thing and get into His thing, and His thing is all those folks out there. It's that thing. We need to get out more. The reason I read, one of the reasons I read those funny quips a while ago, those weird things people say to pastors is because people that say things like that, you know, people that are griping about which way the toilet paper roll is turned in the church restroom, people that think we've got too many hipsters because of the way the coffee shop is done here at the church, and people that say things like that, they got too much time on their hands. <laughs> they got stuff to worry about that's not important. What's important is that we must be about our Father's business. And we need to be outbound. One of the secrets of the early church and its exponential growth, 3,000 saved one day, 5,000 saved another day. By Acts chapter 6, scholars estimate 25, 30, 35,000 members of that church. You talk about a mega church, they had them a mega church. People say, I don't like mega churches. Well, you're in sad shape and bad luck because the first church was a mega church. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I just, I, I, it just gets next to me. People griping about big churches, griping, griping, griping. You know, oh, they don't love anybody. They compromise the truth. Isn't it amazing how they grew that big, loving, not loving people and compromising truth? Well, I know some of them may not care, and maybe some of them may be compromised truth, but surely not all of them do. Let's get off that. Come on, let's get off that. That's a trick of the devil to get us away from our kingdom, our Lord's kingdom growing, expanding, advancing. Is it a bad thing for a church? What if our church became 3,000 by next month? We're going we to we, we go down a row and pick the ones we want to leave because we, we don't like mega churches? Is that what we're going to do? I've heard, I've heard Christians say stuff like this. I've heard them say, well, our church is big enough now. We don't need any more. Oh, I guess that means we just tell all the rest of the world just go to hell. Is that what you mean by that? Because that's what you're saying. Sorry, I didn't mean to shock you, but <laughs> isn't that what they're saying? Pitiful. Just as pitiful as these 11 sitting and mourning and weeping and eating fried chicken because Jesus was dead. He's alive the whole time, you know? We can be, get so pitiful and miss the whole point of things. A church does not exist to sustain itself. This church does not exist just for you and me. You know, you say, well, you say, I've been to the 11 o'clock service. It's pretty full. Well, but it's not full enough. Well, it's pretty full. Well, when it gets full, we'll start another service. How about a 1230 service Sunday afternoon? Man, it's a terrible, a, a church building is a terrible thing to waste. You know how many days and nights it just sits here empty? There, there, there should be no lid on what we think of when we think about winning people to Jesus and, and 
enhancing their lives and teaching them the Word of God and discipling them to live for Him. Let's, let's get out of that kind of thing. And don't let, the, don't let the world and disgruntled Christians and the de-churched people that don't want to go to church anymore, don't let them spoil your faith about let's get something done for God. Let's win souls. Let's, let, let's plunder hell and populate heaven. Come on, let's make a difference in the world. <clears throat> well, okay, so how are, we go, how are we going to get out about it? How are we going to preach this gospel? Well, obviously... You can witness to people that you know and that you're friends with and your relatives, and you can invite them to church. You can invite them to church, and I'll witness to them. Man, we're a team. We're a fishing company. Just invite them to church. In October, we're going to have a, we're going to have a friend day, and we're going to encourage you to invite friends to come to church just one Sunday. You say, well, what's the deal with friend day? It's just an excuse so you can got an excuse to invite them. That's all it is. You know, you got friends you want to invite, you invite them maybe sometime Easter, sometime for Glow. Well, we're going to just create a whole nother weekend, you know, and you're going to go to your friends. You're going to say, hey, hey, uh, our church is having friend day, and you're my friend. W- would you go to church with me? And they'll say, well, wh- what's the big deal? And you're going to say, it's friend day. <laughs> you know, it's friend day, and you're my friend. And pastor wants us all to bring friends. Everybody's bringing friends. I got to have a friend. You're not going to leave me hanging, are you? Aren't you my friend? You know, it's, it's just an excuse to get people in church. And we'll preach a friend. It'll be a Bible story sermon about friendship. And it, I can't blow the whole thing. But, but anyway, but, 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 but we, we do things like that. You know, when we have glow and invite people, we give them the gospel. Like I say, last year, almost 700 people saved just because they came to a concert. Whether we're giving away backpacks or giving away water or having a friend day or, or, or going on television after the first year, going back on television... You know, whatever we do, listen, it's simply outreach. It's reaching outside of our four walls. It's, it, it's, it's, it's finding ways to influence people for the Lord Jesus. Every weekend, thank you, thank you, yeah. Every weekend, we win people to Jesus. We pray a prayer of accepting Jesus into their lives right in front of you. We do it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. You know what? If you come to this church consistently, you have already been equipped to know what to say to somebody. If they come up to you and say, I need God in my life, you can lead them to the Lord because you watch it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Amen? If you, if you, you say, oh, I just can't do it. I'm going to invite them to church. That's, that's uh, okay. And we, and we will win them here. We'll preach to them here. But together, we can reach out. Why do we support missionaries? Because we're outbound. Why do we do crusades? Why have, why have we done 59 citywide crusades in Honduras, plus many more in Mexico and India with our own teams and since the early 90s? We've, we've spent, we've spent uh, wow, hundreds of thousands of dollars in excess of a million, somewhere between a million to a million and a half dollars since 1993, doing our own crusades in other countries. Why have we spent that money? Why have we done that? Why did we get on those planes? Why did we go to Honduras? Why did we go to El Salvador? Why did we go to Mexico? Why did we go to India? Because we're outbound. Because the Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Give the Lord a hand and clap for that. That's our commission. He never said, go hole up somewhere in a catacombs and pray that the Lord will just keep you until the rapture happens. No, he says, we're supposed to be out there making a difference. Out there making a difference. I wish I had time tonight to preach it right, but I got to get to this where I want to get to. So, so because that, that's a bunch of my heart throb is winning souls and making sure people understand how to be made right with God. But, but I'm really talking about the church as a whole. I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about me or our invitations on Sunday. I'm talking about all of us and our mentality. We, want, we need to have this mentality, this go mentality, this out, outbound mentality, this reaching out mentality. Listen, the, the, you know, like a couple of weeks ago when we did the backpack thing, man, I tell you, the Saturday night service was chaos. It was pure chaos. I had to chop off half my, I couldn't even preach half my sermon because the crowd would, would have, uh, there was no way I could get through my points with them. It was just crazy. And, uh, but we, I did, I chopped it off. We did things a little bit different. We had people running around everywhere. We had, we had we had one kid come in with shorts, no shoes, short pants, no shirt. 
just tore at your heart, you know, giving him a backpack. And he was just one of many. I, we, we had our attendance tripled that Saturday night, was giving away the backpacks. Tripled on Saturday night. It was awesome, you know. And, and people got saved. And, you know, what, what, what am I talking about? Sometimes we have to adjust ourselves and adjust our program and adjust our sermons and adjust our ministry and adjust our lives and, and maybe reprioritize ourselves a little bit to make some room for somebody else to come into the family of God. Amen? I want to stop right here and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to change us. Help us to change our minds, our habits, our priorities, our ministry, our church, whatever we got to change so that we can obey this great commission, this first priority of the church of Jesus Christ to reach out beyond our own lives and influence others to come to Jesus and be saved for eternity. Help us to achieve that as a church body in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen to that. Amen. amen. Now, now we, we do that as a church as a whole, but we do it as individuals as well. You can witness to people at your job. You can, I'm not, don't, be, don't be afraid. I'm not going to put a bunch of tracts in your hand, a big black Bible, and a, a megaphone and put you on the corner. I'm not going to do that to you. Okay. Um, I, I get a kick out of some of those guys sometimes. Their heart's in the right place, but I'm thinking, man, it's, it's 98 degrees, and everybody's rolling by with their windows up in the air conditioning, and this guy's out there with a the megaphone going. <laughs> and I'm thinking, dude, get a hint. Uh, he heart in the right, heart's a good heart. Stupid head. <laughs> there's, better, there's a better way to town than on a pogo stick. You know, where, you know where Americans are? They're in front of a television. They're in front of a computer screen. Huh? You know where they are? They're in the park, and they're at work, and they're at the mall, and the theaters, and the schools, and they're in your neighborhoods. I think if I can get you to invite people to church, and if I can get you to just speak up for the Lord, and if I can get you to pray for somebody when they're down or when they're sick, that you are the best method we've got of reaching people in Amarillo, Texas. You and me, one, one, one by one, person by person, heart by heart, name by name. And we all have different levels of boldness and faith, but, I, but Jesus has commanded us to go into all the world. Would that include our world? Would that include Amarillo world? Would that include mall world, school world, classroom world, your workplace world? And I know, I know the, some of the things that hinder us. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I know we're hindered. I know some of us have some compromises in our life and we think we can't say anything. Well, guess what? Let's get the compromises out of our life so we can say something. You know, and some of us are afraid to invite them to church, afraid, man, on the Sunday my friend comes, that's the Sunday they're going to have a tongue and interpretation. Well, get over it. I think the Lord knows better how to reach people than you do. Well, or, or you know, I don't know what Pastor David will say. He's liable to say anything. He's liable to say, you know, if we don't love people, then we're telling them to go to hell. And, and I, 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 I don't know what they would think. Well, you know. You know, and then, and, then, and then some of us go out there and talk a lot worse than that out there. Come on, let's get over ourselves. Let's do, let's do something lest we do nothing. Let's reach people for Jesus. Amen? Okay, and, I, and I've just introduced my time away. I, wa I want to get to these signs. <laughs> I want to get to these signs. He said, Jesus said, if we go out in the world, things that happen. I like this. Things will happen. And I want to I show you these seven supernatural signs that accompany believers like you when we announce good news. It doesn't mean you have to know everything about theology. You don't have to answer all their questions. You don't have to know everything about the Old Testament. You don't have to know all the hard questions, the, the, the answers to the hard questions. You don't have to know everything. You, I tell you, you already know the best thing you could ever know to tell somebody. You know what the Lord has done for you. What a witness. See, that, that's what a witness is. A witness means a, simply an eyewitness. Well, you know, I don't know everything about everything about that wreck, but I know what I saw, and I, this is what I saw. That's all a witness does. He just tells what he saw. And that's all God's asking you to do. Tell what you know. Tell what you saw. Tell what you experienced. Tell them what the Lord did for you. Does that make it simple enough? I'm not going to make you study the Roman road, seven steps, 
you know, salesmanship techniques where you come in soft or come in hard, manipulate people into praying a prayer. I don't believe in that stuff. I think that's crazy stuff. You just don't find that in the Bible. I'll tell you what we got. We got a miracle working God, and we've got our own testimonies, and we got love in our hearts, and we got a Holy Spirit that's upon our lives that can confirm what we tell them is true if we'll just let him out of the out of the cage. You know, you know, if you got a lion in a cage you, and he's hungry and you throw a T-bone steak in front of the cage, you don't have to beg him to come out and get that steak. All you got to do is open the cage. And I'm telling you, that's the way the Lord is. All you got to do is open the cage and the Lord will come upon people. And he will, he will put his testimony in their hearts and he will confirm what you and I share with them in our bumbling way, in our... In our, with all of our mistakes that we may make, I'm telling you, God knows how to reach people. And, and, he, and He's encouraging us here that if we'll just go out and tell, just go tell what we know. Just tell them what you know. Don't try to tell them what you don't know. Just make a fool out of yourself. Just tell them what you know. I don't preach on stuff that I don't know nothing about. Sometimes people like these this paper here, they say, why don't you preach on this? Why don't you preach on that? Why don't you preach on Tim Tebow? I don't know Tim Tebow. I'm not going to talk about Tim Tebow. He's a nice guy, I suppose. That's what they say. Praise God. Praise God for Tim. That's it. That's sum total of all my Tim Tebow, Tebow knowledge. And I'm not going to do a six-part series on Tim Tebow because I don't know nothing about him. And I don't, I don't preach on stuff I don't know about. All I can do is preach on stuff I know about. Tell them what you know. Because what you know is powerful. That's strong. What you don't know is not, it's not available to you. Let somebody else tell that part. Amen? I'm, I'm trying to make this easy for you. It's really easy. It's just go out and tell them what you know. Now these guys, just five minutes ago, they didn't even believe he was alive from the dead. And he's releasing them into the ministry now. Okay, look at me. You see me? Uh -huh. Get out there. You get that? Yeah. Now, they did have three and a half years of training, but they didn't have it all together even after three and a half years of training, did they? And, man, years later, Peter and Paul still arguing over doctrines. You don't have to have everything straight before you start. Just go tell them what you know. Now, I believe there's seven signs here. Some people say, well, I'll just see five signs. Verse 17, and these signs shall follow or accompany believers as they preach the gospel. Well, I believe there's seven signs. I'm going to back up to verse 16. I want you to see this real quickly. He, Jesus said, we're going to go out and preach the gospel. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You, how many of you know when you get saved, you got a knowing down in your knower that you connected with God and that you're saved and you got peace in your heart about it. Amen? That, that, they call that that no-so salvation. That peace that passeth all understanding. you got the inner witness that tells you, I'm a child of God. That velvety-like good feeling down in your spirit. Okay? I believe that's a sign that follows the gospel. God witnesses by His Holy Spirit to someone that they have come into peace with Him and relationship with Him. And he that believes and will act upon the gospel, baptize. Now some people, they make a big deal out of baptize. They say, oh yeah, unless you're baptized, you're not saved. Now no, well, notice something though. He says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. He didn't say he that's baptized not, said he that believes not. So the emphasis is on the believing part. But let me give you a little Greek word lesson just to clarify a little bit, and, and this will explain why I've been preaching some of the things I've been preaching the last year or so about baptism. The word, there's a couple of different forms of the word baptizo in the Greek. The root word is bapto, bapto, which means simply to dip. Bapto means to dip. Baptizo means to dip, submerge, immerse, overwhelm. But the way the Greeks used it was a little bit different sometimes. For instance, they found a document that predates Jesus. This was, I don't know, several scores of years before Jesus lived. And there was a Greek who had written out a recipe for pickles. And he used both the words bapto and baptizo in the making of pickles that helps us to understand the use of the words in the common, in the common language. He said when you're going to make pickles, you need to take these cucumbers and you need to bapto them. Bapto them, in other words, wash them or dip them in clean water. He says, after you have bapto the pickles, then you baptizo the pickles in vinegar. Now, how many of you ladies know the difference in washing pickles and putting them in the vinegar to pickle the pickles? 
It's a whole different thing, right? One's just cleansing them on the outside. The other one is going to be an, a saturation, a, a, a nature change within that cucumber. Now that cucumber is going to become a pickle. Here the word is baptizo. And Jesus is saying something like this. He that believes and will become saturated in the things of God. Changed, transformed, shall be saved. You know, he's not just talking about the act of water baptism as, as important as that is. And that is a first step in saturation. Yes, because we're, you're saturated with the things of God as you obey God and walk with God and experience the things of God. And, and that's why I always reduce this to action. Another scripture says confess with your mouth. Another scripture says uh, publicly speak uh, over in the Gospels. And, and then there's baptism and there's and, and, and there's any number of things though can be an act of faith that shows that you're actively beginning to follow the Lord Jesus. Okay? He doesn't say anything about confession of the mouth here in Romans 10. He doesn't say anything about baptism. But either one of those are simply steps or outward confessions or professions or admissions of faith that it denotes action. How many of you know the Sunday after you get saved you're supposed to come back to church? So, so Christianity is a walk. It's not just praying a prayer. So he's saying it's an act. It's, it's acting on your faith. He that believes and acts upon his faith. He that believes and is saturated with the things of God. He begins to experience the God things. That person is going to be saved. So I'd, I'd just like to explain it like that. Okay? Plus, there has to mean something like that. The baptism thing, if it hangs you up, there are a couple of different scriptures that I can use to prove people were saved before and without water baptism. And I taught that a couple of months ago. I won't go into that tonight. I don't have time. But baptism is important, absolutely. But it's not the being dipped in water that saves you. It's the believing on the crucified Christ who rose again, who will wash you in his precious blood and forgive your sins. Amen? All right, but now what I want you to see is salvation is a sign. The word sign means an indication, miracle, a token, or a wonder. You see, there's a wonder that comes into your heart when you're born again, that peace, that inner witness. It's a token of God on the inside of you. The Spirit of God takes up residence in you. And you, sometimes it's more prevalent than others. Sometimes it takes a while to realize you got it. I'm not talking about a huge physical feeling or goosebumps. I'm just saying that there becomes an, an assurance on the inside of a person's heart that they've connected with God and that God has given them peace and forgiveness and acceptance. Amen? And it's a sign. It's supernatural. The, all these are supernatural. Then the second sign that follows the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, is the sign of condemnation. You see, because if he believes and is baptized, he'll be saved. But if he believes not, the hearer will be condemned or damned, it says there in the King James. Just like there is a sign of salvation and peace in the believer's heart, if we properly preach the gospel and if they heard it, and the Holy Spirit's released into people's presence, it is also true that if someone refuses to believe and accept Christ, when they go away from that gospel encounter, they will go away with a supernatural sign of damnation in their heart. How many of you know that's true? How many of you have ever left a church service feeling pretty low? <laughs> Amen? Because you knew you did not act on what the Holy Spirit was trying to get you to do. I'm talking about being in being saved. How many of you remember fighting off conviction and fighting off accepting the Lord earlier in your life? Amen? And what happened? There was a sign that came to you. I call it the sign of condemnation. Uh, not that God is a condemner, but it's a sign that lets you know you're not right with God. How many of you know that's, that's a gift from God to know when you're right with God to know when you're not right with God? So I believe that those are the first two supernatural signs. Then he says, and. Now the word and means plus, additionally. In other words, he's already begun to talk about signs. Now he's going to show us five more signs that accompany us as we preach the gospel. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. The casting out of demons is a real thing that happens. I don't have time for it tonight. I've got a testimony right here. I'll just have to share it later in church. I've got to, I've got to close on time tonight because we have a, a meeting that some of you are going to. But it's the testimony of a of a young man who came in our service and he had had a drug addiction for years and he got set free, bam, in a prayer line, instant of time, delivered from the power of drugs. 
That's a spirit of bondage deliverance. So the third sign that follows the preaching of the gospel is deliverance. Everybody say deliverance. The fourth sign, they shall speak with new tongues. Wherever we preach the gospel and people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they begin to speak in a new spiritual prayer language. A prayer language. That prayer language is a sign that accompanies the gospel. People say, well, that tongue stuff is of the devil. And yet they never speak in tongues at the bar. They never speak in tongues in the crack houses and the hell holes and the houses of prostitution. They, they don't speak in tongues there. But you go to some churches, whoo, we speak it in tongues, man. And they know we're believers. Hello. It's a mark. It's a sign. It's a token of faith. It's one of many, but it is one. I mean, you know you go to church service and there's three or four people speaking in tongues. There's some believing going on in that place, right? They, these people are in it to win it. How many of you know they're committed to this thing? Amen? They're going all in. You don't have to doubt that now. I, oh, but, but that's enough said about that. That's the fourth sign is spiritual language. Number five, authority. He said they'll take up serpents. Now he's already talked about casting out demons. Here he says they'll take up, the word is arrow in the Greek. They'll, they'll pick up and convey to a distance serpents. Now he's not talking about snake handling, but he does want you to handle the devil. Serpents are symbolic of Satan. Now the first mention of demons, he says, in my name they'll cast out demons. That's when I cast demon out of somebody else. But this sign here, this is authority. This is me taking care of the devil in my own life. This is my walk through life. I run into a snake. I just pick him up gingerly, lay him aside. You're not going to hold me back, devil. And I keep on walking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle the devil. That's authority. Amen? We've been given authority over the devil. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Give the Lord a hand clap. Authority over Satan. In your own life, we, 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 at times we'll, we'll, we'll take authority over the devil in somebody else's life and cast the devil out of their life. It could be a devil of bondage, a spirit of drug addiction. It could be uncleanness. It could be fear, spirits of fear. There's all kinds of different kind of demonic spirits mentioned in Scripture. It's real. It's one of the signs that follow the gospel, but also the authority to take control of your life and not let the devil mess you up. That's a sign and a wonder. And then number six is protection. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Uh, back in 2 Kings chapter 4, the prophet Elisha may, uh, had him make a stew for his students. And they cut up some kind of strange gourd in that stew. And it ended up to be poison. They said, oh, prophet, they said, there's death in the pot. They said, oh, we're poisoned. He said, he said bring me some meal. He took meal. And sprinkled it in the stew, says you can eat it now, and they ate it, and they were just fine. And what was that? That was a divine miracle of protection from being poisoned. I've heard of testimonies of that happening in our modern day world. I don't have time to go into detail, but in other words, God can protect you from some stuff. How many of you know sometimes you have enemies that you need the Lord to protect you from? Oh, yeah. How many of you know sometimes some people are out to get you, but the Lord can protect you? Sometimes even in your own household, but the Lord can protect you. Divine protection is one of the signs that followed the gospel. And then he says, and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Healing through our hands is a sign that follows the gospel. Healing. Seven supernatural signs that can accompany our lives as we simply walk with Jesus and we become outbound and we share what we know with people. I want you to stand up with me. I want you to know that you can affect, you can have those signs accompanying your life. I'm telling you, if you'll be an outbound Christian sharing what you know, people are going to get saved around you. If you'll be an outbound Christian telling people what you know, some people are going to have the sign of damnation in their heart when they leave your presence because they're going to know that you're right with God and they're not. It's not like we're trying to guilt trip them, but they're going to have a knowing. It's not like a guilt trip. It's like a knowing that they're not there yet. And they need that revelation. If you'll be an outbound Christian, and if we'll be an outbound church, miracles of deliverance, people speaking in, a, in that spiritual language, the authority to... To, to walk all over the devil. <laughs> That's, uh, I want to say it like that. He doesn't have to, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't need to be running from the devil. The devil needs to be running from you. And then 
miracles of protection, the Lord taking care of saving you out of that car accident when you should have died. And people getting healed all around you just because you share what you know. I want you to reach out and take hold of the hand of the person next to you right now as we're closing. Just reach out and take hold of their hand. You're laying hands on them right now, laying hands on them touching them. And the Holy Spirit that's in you will flow out of you into them. And if there's sick people here tonight, they can be healed right now. We had some people healed Sunday night. You can get healed Wednesday night, right? Because the Holy Spirit is here and Jesus has given us the signs. Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody pray this with me. Father, in Jesus' name, by faith, I believe healing power flows through me into my family, my brother, my sister, my neighbor. I believe it. Be healed, family of God, in the name of Jesus. Now, I want you to believe it right now. Power flows through your hands right into their bodies. In the name of Jesus, I come against sickness and pain and infirmity, and I command it, leave them now in the name of Jesus to confirm the gospel we've preached tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Everybody gives God praise. Let's give Him praise. Man, I love that subject. I could preach for another hour or two hours on that. I wish I'd had the time to do that. But we got meetings. Listen, some of you, you've been invited to the parents of our GEAR students meeting, junior high and high school age. That meeting is starting about right now. You need to go over to that room right now. All right. God bless you. Have a great night. Thank you.